Hey, hey, what's up, my friend? So today, we have Oliver Kell on the show. What's interesting about Oliver is that he took part in the US Investing Championship in 2020 during COVID. And guess what? He came in first place, right, with a staggering return of 941.1% in a year. Okay, that's like having a $10,000 training account in January and then turning that account to $100,000 by the end of December. Crazy stuff, right? So if you want to connect with Oliver, I'll put his social media profile in the description below. But moving on, right, here's what we covered, right, during my conversation with Oliver. So the first thing we spoke about is market making because Oliver's dad used to be a market maker for the Pacific Stock Exchange. So we spoke about market making because I believe that's something that many traders are not familiar with. Then we talk about how institutions, how do they trade with size without being easily detected unless you know what to look for. And of course, right, Oliver shares right, what, what's the thing to look for. Then he also talked about his early failures at stock trading and the lessons behind it. He shares his favorite trading setup, the things he looks for in a chart and give us you know, a ton of trading examples, including you know, his entries, stops, targets, and his top process right behind taking those trades. So all this and more in today's conversation. Sounds good? Then go watch it right now. So first and foremost, right, uh, Oliver, I just want to say a huge thank you because, you know, uh, ever since I saw your the World Cup Trading Championship, you have 941% return. The why, the why I'm saying thank you is because that sets a huge inspiration to a lot of retail traders out there to know that, you know, anyone, right, you know, without any, you know, backing, without, you know, working for, you know, banks, institutions can also, you know, achieve such trading results. So I, I believe that is a testament, right, to a retail trader that, they have the potential to achieve big things if they, you know, set their mind to it. So thank you for, you know, setting that benchmark, you know, being such an inspiration to a lot of us out there. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> thank you. I was just, so, you know, doing my best. <laughs> so let's kind of like, you know, because I've heard you on a, a numerous podcast, like I think on a Trader Liar and et cetera. And I think you mentioned your father was also a trader on the Pacific Stock Exchange, if I'm not wrong, as a market maker. Did I get yeah. that? Yeah. 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 So, I think a number of the listeners who are tuning in here today they probably are wondering what what exactly does a market maker do? Right? Something we don't hear often these days. Sure. So, uh, so yeah. I mean, my dad went to the floor with like literally no money, more or less, um, and you know, just kind of built his business. Um, and essentially, is what market making is in in. I guess, so my dad was the, the lead market maker in Lockheed Martin, you know, in like the, you know, the eighties, maybe early nineties. And then he was the LMM in Microsoft, which was obviously, you know, in the late nineties, you know, early nineties or so, you know, pretty hot stock. And essentially is what a market maker does. The easiest way to describe it is that they, you know, when somebody wants to sell, they're obligated to provide a bid. And when somebody wants to buy, they're obligated to provide an offer to sell. And the way they're able to do that is that they hedge their positions with options. Um, so my dad was a Delta neutral trader, um, essentially meaning that he didn't trade directionally. He basically, you know, created a market and hedged his deltas to stay neutral. And, you know, the idea of it was that he, he was able to provide liquidity and create a stable market. Um, and now I, I think there's a lot more to it than that. You know, when I talk to my dad about it, you know, he says things that I don't think a lot of options traders say today, like, you know, he traded reversals and conversions and stuff like that which really I, I don't entirely know what all that means, even though he's explained it to me. Um, we, we trade much differently. Um, but, you know, the way I kind of think about it is that he was able to sometimes make money on options to Kang and then stop. You know, he's told me times where he was, you know, long stock and hedged with the options and the options decayed and he made money there and the stock went up and he made money there. Um, and, and, you know, I think that's essentially how, how he made money. And then occasionally, 
you know, I know that he did take some shots. Like I know one of his biggest trades ever was, I guess it was TWA, uh, Trans World Airlines, which was an old airline. Um, you know, I, they were around when I was a kid, but they're no more anymore. But, you know, he made an enormous amount of money when I think they got bought out or something. I don't know all the details. But occasionally he would take, you know, trades, like, you know, directional trades. But I would say, you know, 95, 98% of what he did was just make markets in Lockheed and then Microsoft. I mean, he pretty much traded one ticker. And I think if he did stuff outside of that, you know, he did sort of view it a, a little more as kind of speculating, like, hey, I think this stock is going up, but, you know, he would do it with a small amount of his capital. Um, you know, the core of what he did was make markets in those two stocks. I'm curious, right? Because, you know, back then when I was a prop trader, I, I have seen traders doing something similar where they just, the futures market, right? They just queue on the beat and the offer. And if the market, let's say it's kind of just choppy range, but it just goes up, goes up, not going anywhere. Yeah, the, the market maker, they make pretty good money. But when the market starts to trend in one direction, that's where the trader starts, you know, taking losses, right? So when you mentioned that your father used to do something along those lines, but he hedged it with options. So how does using options helping to, to hedge if the market does get directional, hedge the position. I don't think you can do it like close to 100%. Maybe hedging is probably, I don't know, 70, 80% at best. So, I mean, look, if you were to talk to a, someone who really, really understood options, which I'm not that guy, I just kind of understand it from a high level. But, okay. you know, your delta is essentially how much your option is moving relative to the underlying stock. So the idea is, is that he was hedging his deltas. Um, so depending on, you know, different, uh, again, we're a little out of my wheelhouse, but depending on different things like, you know, time decay and things like that, the volatility of the option relative to the underlying, you know, he, the idea was that he was always hedged one-to-one -one with the delta, the deltas of his position. Um, and then the other thing that I would, you know, that I think is very important to highlight is the markets were much different. So my dad worked on the floor and he did what was called open outcry. So, you know, the markets were not a hundred, you know, they weren't electronic and they became electronic, you know, pretty much near the end of his time on the floor. And so like, let's, you know, there were definitely times, I mean, you know, I wasn't there, but you know, you, but there were definitely times where, you know, an order would come into the floor from, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know who would like, let's just say an institution, hey, you know, buy me 50,000 Microsoft at X price. And like, they were good to get filled at that price, but the market had already moved like a point. <laughs> so it was like free money um in that sense i mean i don't know how often that happened I, I think as time went on and markets became more and more efficient it happened less and less but i definitely know you know maybe maybe you know i think at the beginning of my career my dad had some ups and downs and almost almost didn't make it but you know maybe in the mid 80s late 80s uh you know he was really doing well um, I know, I know the crash in, in 89 was like one of his best days ever. And it's just, it, it could have been better. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I sort of know the, the high level details on the story, but he basically was really set up to where he could have made a lot of money on that. But, you know, something happened. He, he blames Goldman, <laughs> but you know, something happened where he had to, you know, rehedge his deltas, and then if he hadn't had to make that, you know, adjustment into the close, he would have really made a lot of money on on Black Monday. Um, but you know, like, so I don't know exactly how all that position happened or was or was put on, but um, it all has to do with you know providing a market to who wanted to buy and sell and then and then hedging your deltas i mean that's that's what he did for for years black shorts model type stuff um and then really the way i think about it is that as computers kind of came into the market and they made the markets more efficient you know the option strikes 
you know, you went from having stocks with like five, ten dollar strikes to like one dollar strikes. You know, things became more efficient. It made it a lot harder for a you know vanilla options market, you know, market maker to make money. Um, and then you were also you started to compete with computers, and then you sort of lost that. I think I don't know this, but I want to say even in like the mid nineties. There was still, you know, some free money in the open outcry every now and then. And, you know, nowadays, because, well, I haven't been into the floor. or I, Actually, the PSC is now an Equinox, a gym now. But uh, I did go into the floor with my dad in uh, 2000 and either 2009 or 10. Um, and it was still there. The PSE, PSE became the ARCA exchange. When the NYC bought the PSE, it became ARCA. And there were actually some, some younger guys, you know, probably around my age now, who were the sons of, you know, guys my dad had traded with. Um, and, you know, they weren't, you know, there was nothing going on there. It was like perfectly quiet. You know, computers were, were running everything. And even for me, you know, I probably went to the floor maybe like eight or 10 times realistically in the time my dad worked on the floor. Um, and it seemed weird for me. And so I know it seemed like really, really weird for my dad. But I also know it was like emotional for him because, uh, you know, the floor was like it definitely had that kind of locker room type feel. You know, you were kind of in the pits with like the same guys bumping shoulders every day. Um, and you know, like, I, I think you had a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, deep, good memories from, from working down there. Whereas like now, like me, I literally straight in my house in this seat. And I mean, I, I'm in a discord with, you know, two or three guys. Um, but it's just much different. Um, you know, like there's not there's not that same camaraderie component I, component I think that he had, um, and I did I did prop trade my first year or two, and I think kind of when you're on the desk um, with other guys, there there's you know definitely some camaraderie, but as far as how I trade now, you know that doesn't really exist. So it's it's just you know it's much different. Um, uh, I, I sort of went on a tangent there, but I'm just kind of thinking about, you know, kind of how he traded and how it all was. And, and he would tell me, you know, uh, he didn't spend a lot of time, you know, talking to people on the floor. You know, my dad had five kids and he was like, you know, I went there to work. I was totally focused. You know, basically he was really good at doing quick math in his head. Um, and, Unfortunately, computers kind of were quicker than him. Um, but so he was really focused all day. But, you know, I just know because even now, you know, my dad's in his, in his late 70s. You know, he'll get together with a lot of the guys from the floor. You know, some of the guys from the floor, like I call my uncle, um, even though they're not. But, you know, it's just like very tight, tight knit kind of environment. Um, and, you know, probably part of the reason for that is realistically is cause, you know, not a lot of people made it still. And, and, uh, you know, I know numerous guys who, you know, my dad in the end being one of them who maybe had, you know, long careers and then, you know, kind of got washed out the, the backside. So, um, you know. I don't know. It's just much different than, than how it is, how it is for me, but it's, it's pretty cool. You know, like the floor was, was great. The energy was, was awesome. And I mean, I was only maybe, you know, 10 years old when I would, when I would go down there. So it was, uh, it was a cool spot. That was a great sharing, right? Even though you went off tangent, but you know, I think it's something that a lot of traders these days, right? That we won't get to experience it ever again, right? Because of, you know, the advancement in technology. So that's kind of like a very nice glimpse into what it's like, right? Trading in the 70s, the 80s. And this kind of reminds me, I think there was like a documentary called 
I think if I'm not wrong, it's called float, right? Basically, it's a transition of how the bit traders transit to the electronic trading and how a lot of them just didn't make it. So it was quite a interesting documentary. Not sure if you watched that one, but yeah, something that came to my mind, right? As you were talking yeah, about. Yeah, I haven't yeah. seen it, but I, I just know because I know a lot of these guys that trade with my dad that very few of them were able to transition to electronic trading. Um, yeah. I know of one guy who has made an exorbitant amount of money now. Um, but I know even he, when he transitioned from the floor to electronics and he'd done very well on the floor, he, he worked in the Microsoft pit. Um, he went through like a three or four year period where he, he didn't know how to make money. And I think he kind of reinvented himself with like an entirely different, you know, way of approaching the market. Um, and you know, my dad, my dad still trades you know i mean my dad my dad's like retired now but he still traded off the floor for probably another i don't know maybe 10 years if i had to guess you know probably up until like 2012 13 ish you know maybe those last couple of years I, I think he kind of realized that he needed to hang it up but but I, i'm not so sure i mean I, i'm not positive but i'm not so sure you know they were having the same success. No, definitely not the same success as on the floor. It, it was just different, you know, totally different ball game. Right. So maybe now let's kind of like take a step back away from your dad and talk about you, right? No, I want yeah. to learn more about, you know, your childhood. So maybe in, in, uh, in one sentence, how would you describe your, your childhood? I mean, you know, look, I, I, uh, I had, a, I had a good childhood, but it, you know, it was kind of like a tale of two stories, I guess you could say. So, uh, you know, you know, my, my dad, uh, I didn't know if it was all because my dad blew up or, or what, but you know, my parents ended up splitting up and I, you know, I think it had something to do with, with that. And so I lived in Marin County in California, which is like a very, very, you know, high end, very nice place to live. And, and, you know, I think we had it pretty good. Um, but you know, when you're like 10, 12 years old or less than that, you kind of don't really think like that, you know, you're just a kid and, and every day is great. Um, but then, you know, my parents split and, and we moved back East and, you know, things were definitely a lot, a lot harder. Um, and we, and we, <laughs> and we realized how good we had it, you know, after that, um, and so, you know, I definitely, you know, when I was a kid, I probably started working when I was maybe, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade. Um, you know, I worked at a moving company, played a lot of sports. Um, that was kind of our thing is we all played sports. We were good athletes and, and we started working cause you know, we kind of had to, and our, our summer league basketball coach was, you know, he owned the moving company we worked at. And, you know, so in a way, you know, I don't know if I'd say fatherly figure, but he was definitely sort of like a, a definite disciplinarian in our, in our, in our life. You know, he, he didn't take a lot of, a lot of crap and, you know, it's just like high school and, and, uh, you know, then I ended up playing football in college, which, which was good. Cause I, I got into a pretty good school, you know, pretty like cause of sports. And, uh, you know, that, that was good. And I met, met some great friends there. Actually, probably the guy who is the reason that I trade, um, a guy who played football with me, he ended up prop trading right out of college and he was a year or two older than me. And, you know, I already sort of knew what trading was just cause obviously, you know, my dad did it. But it was not something I really wanted anything to do with, you know, kind of for, you know, you can kind of fill in the blank there as to why. Um, but, you know, as I kind of got to my senior year, I was a competitive guy and I went to a really good school. And so I feel like my school kind of pushed you towards, you know, go be an investment banker, go be, you know, one of those types of uh, high-end finance jobs because, you know, those types of companies recruited at my school. So, you know, you, you, you wanted that job because that was like the glitz and glamour uh, job. But, uh, 
you know, I couldn't get any of those jobs. And I realized that pretty quickly. <laughs> I really, you know, I, I, I was a solid student. I had like a throw out, but I was not the guy, um, you know, three out and uh, was not the guy, you know, hitting the three, eight, three, nine, whatever. Um, and so they were not going to hire me. And I sort of realized that. So then, then my options were, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do at all. Um, I knew that if I had gotten any job, I was competitive and, 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 and would have done well. And I, and I still think if any of those people had hired me, I would have done well. Um, but my buddy started sending me some of the books from the reading list at this prop firm he worked at. And it was, you know, to me, the elite prop firm that you could work at in, in New York. And so I started reading these books and then, you know, my dad was still trading. So I sort of started talking to him about trading. And then I was talking to my buddy all the time. I mean, he was learning because he was his first year trading. And it's almost like we were just absorbing just tons of information together. I mean, I must have busted through this reading list of like 20 books and like, I don't, I don't know, you know, one semester, I, I was spending way more time reading about my trading books and stuff than I was at school by that point. Um, and, you know, I, I looked at a couple other jobs, you know, like I, I got a job offer to like sell insurance and, and some stuff like that at, at like good companies. My mom was like happy about that. Um, she definitely wanted me to do that. Um, and that is what ended up happening is I, you know, there's the, there's to me pretty, pretty scammy prop firms in the U S where you go put up like five grand and they tell you that you're going to trade their money or whatever. Um, but in reality, you know, you put up 5k and you know, that's your, that's your risk capital, right? Um, once you burn your 5k, you're out, they don't actually take any risk on you. And then they also collect commissions on the shares you trade. And it's what, so, so I ended up doing that and it's what they taught us to do was to read the level two screen. So like we just looked at the level two screen and they taught us to look for big bids and big offers on the level two. And let's say like Visa had a $300,000 or 300,000 share bid at like 75 bucks, you know, as the stock came into 75, you know, we'd buy like a thousand shares and, and or like, you know, like 75, 15, you'd buy a thousand shares, $150 risk. At 75, 10, you'd buy like a thousand more, you know, or, or, you know, really we were, we were trading even smaller than that starting out. I think we had like a $200 limit down day or, or something like that. So, you know, maybe I'd be buying a hundred shares or 200. I can't even remember at this point and 7505, you know, buy even more. So, you know, next thing you know, you have, uh, let's, let's just say I was buying like 200, 200, 200 or something. So you'd have like 600 shares and in theory you'd have, you know, like $50 risk or something. Um, and sometimes you did because <laughs> sometimes you'd get out when the 300 K printed or a lot of the time you did actually. Um, but sometimes that 300 K would print quick because like everybody in the room would be in it. And, you know, there was another crap prop for the door over that had the same strategy. So everybody would be in these same, and when that thing would print, you know, it'd go like 75 bucks to like, you know, 74, and you know, you'd be down like five, $600, which, which when you're, when you're 23, at least for me, cause I didn't have any money. So like all of my money was in that account and I was actually sleeping on my buddy's couch. Who was the, was the prop trader. I think I was paying him 400 bucks a month. And I was bringing in food from Costco when I'd come down on the train. Oh man, it was, it was, it was so, uh, it was so rugged. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I think I, I think I, I hung in there for maybe like three to six months. Um, one of my issues was, and I think it was for a lot of us is that we would be, we would be so happy to like have days where we'd make money, you know, that the days we'd be up like three or $400 or something like that. You know, we, even if you like, cause, cause sometimes the money would get put in on these big bids. And if you actually understood charts and things that I didn't understand at the time, 
you would realize like, oh man, I'm buying this from the low of the day. And I got like four or 500 shares and the thing could move four bucks, which wouldn't be that ridiculous. You know, it'd be like a two or 3% move or something. And, uh, you know, you could make two grand, you know, but, but a lot of the times we were, we were, we were taking our, you know, 50, 60 cent profit. If that, if that, you know, so I'm sure we were selling some at like 20, 30 cents. And that's really kind of what we were taught to do anyway. You know, we were basically taught to scalp on the level two. Um, but the good guys in the room, they would scalp and they'd hit that 300 K bid like three or four times, but they'd hold a runner and, and, you know, they, and they were good too. They, you know, they've been trading longer than us and they built a bigger bankroll and they would, you know, maybe they'd have 5,000 shares or some of them like 25,000 shares where I had like 500, but on the run, they would hit it in, in bank, you know, a couple times. Cause that's the thing you'd, you'd sell for 20 cents and, and load back up until, until that big bidder offer print. Um, but they might have, you know, a couple thousand shares left for the three or four point move. And that's really where I think they would make, you know, 80% of their money. And then they would kind of make solid money on their scalps and then pay for a lot of their losses with the scalps. Um, but I think the younger guys are guys like me, we never really, we, we never really made that money that kind of got us over the top. So we were sort of just like kind of not losing a lot of money, but not making a lot of money. And uh, I think I, I lost $2,500 after like, I, I really can't remember how many months I was there. It was so long ago, like, but four to six months, let's say. And in hindsight, I actually think that was pretty good <laughs> with how we were trading. Um, but the amount of shares we must have traded was 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 a lot. So the people who owned the room, they were making a penny a share on us. You know, they were and they had a room of 40, 50 guys. And I would say in the four to six months I was there, I watched, you know, 50 percent of the room turn over two or three times. And I watched like 70 or 80 percent of the room turn over at least once. And there were maybe, you know, there were like three or four really good guys. And then one of the guys that owned the room, he owned it with a partner. He was really, really, really good. And the other guy, like, I, he was he was definitely, I don't even think he traded. I mean, he was he was definitely a sketch ball. Um, but I do, I don't really know this, but I do think that prior, so this was around 2010, and I want to say maybe in the early 2000s, that's how a lot of these guys traded. Um, and, it, and, it, and I think it did actually work pretty well. Um, but now I think if you tried that, I think there's so much fake order flow on the, on the level two. I mean, I don't look at the level two at all anymore. But I think there's so much fake order flow that... You know, it, it's it's tough to tell what's what's real and what's not. And you know, we learned other stuff too, like refreshing buyers and sellers. Like, how do you know if you have something that can really move has a real buyer and it's stuff like that. And uh, you know, I I think trying to do stuff like that now would be very difficult. But but it's not it's not part of what I do. Um, but I would be interested to know if anyone still tries to trade like that or not. I, I would, I would think no, but you know, there's probably someone out there that does. Yeah. This kind of reminds me of back then when, uh, I was a prop trader trading the Japanese futures market. Yeah. Many of the traders, they were just scalping off the level two as well. They don't look at charts. And then back then, probably around 2006, seven, right. Uh, for the Japanese futures market, the decay two to five, the market isn't as, uh, sophisticated as it is today. So basically a lot of the order flow. It's quite legit, right? It's not like, you know, a fixed, fixed order. So a lot of them made a lot of money during that period. But when right. the algorithm came in, like maybe after the 08, 09 financial crisis, a lot of them just couldn't adapt to the new change in market structure. And most of them, right. I think, from what I know, stopped trading altogether because their age is, is no longer there. Yeah. So yeah, maybe just, it's, yeah. it's amazing when you think, you know, we talked about my dad, open outcry, right? Totally different from, I mean, that's totally non-existent today. And then I guess what I started out doing was something that probably worked a couple of years before I started doing it. And there were definitely people doing it when I was doing it who were, who were, who were making money for sure. Um, 
And then, uh, but I would be surprised if that works at yeah. all now, you know, maybe, maybe, but I, I would be very surprised. Um, you know, and then, but I do think that there's many things that have stood the test of time, you know, like charts and, and things like that. You know, I think the way like Livermore is probably the main guy that I really love. And I, I, I think if you gave him some charts and, and things today, I, I think he could, he could make money. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just amazing to think about how the markets have changed and, uh, you know, how they, how they will change going forward, you know, and I, I don't know if it'll affect like how we use charts and stuff, who knows? Um, but it'll, it'll be interesting. They will change in, in some capacity. I have no doubt about that. Yep. And maybe let's kind of like take a step back. I'm still, you know, interested to hear maybe about your growing up years, right? From what I'm hearing, yeah. you're kind of like a competitive person. So sure. just want to know, right? You no, know, what, what triggered that competitiveness in you? Did something happen or were you just naturally you know, born with this, this trait of yours? Well, so we were, we were, we were always good athletes. I mean, even when we were, you know, little kids, like we were always really good athletes and, and my older brother is a, a year older than me. And, you know, my, my older brother was, I mean, he still is to this day. I mean, he's probably one of the best basketball players I've ever, I've ever seen. Um, I mean, I mean he's unbelievable. Um, and so we, we were probably, I would say a basketball family, at least at that stage. And so, you know, everywhere I went, you know, my brother was unbelievable and I was a really good player for my grade. I was always like one of the best players, but I mean, my brother was so far and away better than everybody else. He would always be playing up, you know, like in like fifth grade, you know, like if the eighth grade needed a guy or whatever, like my brother would play and like, he'd be one of the best players. Like he was unbelievable. And so my guess is that probably created you know, some of, uh, my competitiveness and that, you know, I was kind of definitely always second best without a doubt, you know, never even remotely close to first and, and it, rightfully so. I mean, I, I was nowhere near as good. Um, but I think probably is what really triggered it is, you know, when my parents split and we moved to, a, you know, we moved to like a nice town, but we were definitely, you know, we were definitely, you know, some of the least well-off people there. Um, and I think, uh, you know, and it was like, a, I don't want to say like stereotypical, but, you know, my mom was like a single mom in like a Massachusetts town. You know, people weren't exactly, I shouldn't say that. Not everybody was, you know, like the most like, welcoming of her or whatever and you know my mom was working you know multiple jobs you know to kind of provide for like five kids and you know sort of the way that we were you know uh accepted was basically through sports because we were really good good at sports and uh you know, so therefore, I, I think like that's kind of where we had to go make it happen and earn it and, you know, kind of prove ourselves. And I think that was definitely real for sure. Um, and, and we did. <laughs> I mean, we were, we definitely did. Um, but so I think, I think that was probably, you know, more of it. And then I also think just like over the years, like multiple examples where, you know, I, I, maybe it was just in my own head, but I, I created this thing in my head where I felt slighted, you know, like, uh, things changed a lot, move, moved to Massachusetts. Things are clearly different. And, you know, we're, I don't want to say like outcast. Cause like I had, I have great friends from high school. They're my best friends still, but we were, we were, we were probably a little different, but at the same time, like, I had come from seeing like, you know, pr pretty significant wealth. And so we, we didn't have it, but I definitely, you know, I knew what, what, what you could do where, where, as I think a lot of people, like I, I basically, I view like I kind of lived the richest of rags story a little, but I knew, I knew what you could have in the world. You know what I mean? And, and like, I wanted that back like bad. Um, 
And then, and then, you know, out of college, literally applying to all of these jobs and just like getting rejected by literally everybody, at least for the jobs that I wanted. And, and I was already competitive as an athlete, but at the end of the day, you know, I wasn't going to play pro sports. So, you know, I had to kind of face the facts that, you know, Hey, we're, we're entering the next phase and like, you're not good enough, you know, or like, at least that's what they're telling you. And, and, uh, you know, I never was going to have, I was never going to accept that. Definitely not. So I just kind of had to figure, figure it out. Um, and that made me competitive, you know, Hey, this guy's getting this job and I'm not, you know, I, I, I just think that's like some little rich kid who's like connected. Like that was kind of my mentality. And like, I think that's, I think that's BS. Like, you know, like, like, how can I, how can I make it happen? And, uh, and so like, I think all these things, you know, one after the other is what, is what made, made me extremely competitive. Um, and then, you know, as I, you know, got further in my career, it's like, just, uh, like just so many failures and having to, you know, figure out how to, how to like kind of get back up again. And I, I think, you know, it just kind of builds resolve and, uh, resilience and, you know, it's just like, you just, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure like every person who trades has similar, uh, failures, you know, which we can get more into as, as we go. But, um, but I think that's kind of how that basically I built a huge chip on my shoulder that I think was built up over years, you know, starting from when I was a little kid, but just amplified dramatically just from that major, major life change that occurred when we moved from the West coast to the East coast and just how everything changed, like everything changed. Um, and then, and then just kind of feeling like I always had to kind of prove myself, I think from, from that point on. Yeah. So you mentioned about getting back on your feet, right? After failure, after failure. So I'm curious to hear, you know, what, what goes through your mind, right? You know, maybe after, failure you know what what's the kind of the, the pep talk you have in your head the voices in your head what, what's it what's it saying to you after failure after failure well yeah i mean that's a good question and i and i think that it, it changed <laughs> those voices in your head and all that stuff they're there with every time you have a setback but i also think that it it changes like you know when you're 22 years old you know it's like the end of the world for you because like you're so naive as to how young you are that it's like all right like like looking back now you're just like all right like you you never had really any you know you lost 2500 bucks and like you moved home to mom's house for like six months or three months or whatever like not that big a deal but at the time you know it was like the biggest catastrophe in the history of mankind like how was i going to go on you know um but at the same time, you're also like, all right, like this strategy I was doing didn't work. Like I, I never really viewed it as a failure. I was like, all right, this didn't work. Like I got to figure something else out that, that's going to work. And so basically is what I did is I went back to my mom's house and like, man, I didn't even know who I f was following. And like, I don't think there was any Twitter or anything at the time. At least I wasn't on it or, or maybe, maybe like a year later I was on it, but I found some guy in, in some room who, who, who was running a prop firm in New York that in hindsight was probably his, his model was a little similar to the people I was at, but I do think this guy was genuinely trying to teach people. And, and actually I think because he was a little more, uh, <laughs> I think because he, how should I put this? Um, I think because like he had a heart, like he actually wanted people to do well is probably why his prop room didn't work because <laughs> he wasn't willing to just like sell anything. Like he wanted people to learn how to trade correctly and stuff. So I sort of started to learn from this guy, like he had like this virtual room or something. And I think I was like trading the, the E minis. Like I had a couple grand and like, I, I can't even remember. Maybe I could trade like one contract or, or something. And I was like doing that from literally like my bedroom from a laptop or something. I think my mom and my sister, like they thought I was like 
like crazy. Like I, I, they didn't know what I was doing up there all day, but I, but I was studying like every day, like that's what I was doing. And I'm sure a lot of the days I wasn't even trading at all. Um, cause I was also working at the moving company too, but like I wasn't full time. And so they didn't always have hours for me, even though I'd worked there for a long time. Um, and then I was fortunate in that a guy that I played football with, um, his dad knew a guy who ran a firm in Stanford and it was these guys that split off from that really legit prop firm that my buddy worked at. And I guess technically they were like a hedge fund, but in reality it was like five or six guys that, that split off and they basically just wanted to kind of prop trade, but you know, in a smaller group. And I think a lot of them were from that like Stamford, White Plains, New York area. So it kind of allowed them to live closer to home or whatever. And so I was very fortunate in that I was able to kind of get in there as an assistant. And so these guys did international arbitrage, which was much different than anything. I didn't even know this existed. Like I had no idea that any of this existed at all. And so I assisted these two guys and one of them was very aggressive trader, like really, really swung for the fences, at least at the time. I'm still friends with him now. And I think he's much more, uh, he's less aggressive now. <laughs> I don't know, maybe he is, I don't know. Um, and then the other was so conservative, so conservative that like if he lost money, it was like the sky was falling. And actually, I don't know this, but I don't think he lost money that much. But I also don't think he ever really, really killed it. But I think emotionally, just like the uncertainty of like money, money making, you know, via trading war on him. And, and I, and, you know, he got out of the business, um, you know, a little bit after, after we, you know, broke up as a group. Um, but it's kind of funny cause I would say he probably made money. At least this was my impression, you know, most days, um, relative to, you know, some other, you know, most people that trade, but I just think that the whole idea that there was a chance that he might not have made money really scared him. And, and, you know, now actually, actually he met his wife through me and he's got like three kids now and he's super happy. So, so it all like worked out amazingly for him. Um, but it was just interesting that I was kind of, uh, and, and you guys were great friends too. And I, and I'm sure they're still great friends today if I had to guess, but I was assisting these two like polar opposite, uh, you know, trading personalities. And like, trust me when I say I got to witness the extremes of, of each, um, but basically from a strategy perspective is what we did is we really only traded a couple stocks. So we traded news core. So this conservative guy, I want to say that he traded news core a hundred percent of the time. And so news core traded between the U S and Australia. And, you know, there were, there were, so even, even international arbitrage, the way that the first strategy I did, I think worked a couple years before I did it. I think international arbitrage a couple of years before I got there, there were legitimate easy arbs that were, I don't want to say free money because nothing's ever free, but pretty consistent free money where, where news core in the U S would be like a percent and a half higher than Australia. You would short the U S close, you know, do half your Aussie dollars and then buy it back in Australia, do the rest of your Aussie dollars and like make a percent. <laughs> and I think that it, uh, I think that guys did that, you know, pretty consistently, like prior to when I kind of got into it. And then I think when I got into it and, 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 and again, I didn't realize this at the time because I just like, didn't even know enough to realize it, but you know, you go look at a chart of news score now, NWSA, I mean, it breaks out and it goes up in the U S and then let's say it was trading at a premium to Australia guess what it was going to do? It was going to even go up higher in Australia because it's like a clean breakout. So even though it looked like there would be an ARB there, there really wasn't. It was just like there was momentum. 
And I, and I think if I had realized that at the time, I would have done better doing the international art stuff. Um, but then we, there were other trades uh, that were, were pretty, you know, we traded BHP in Rio uh, between Australia and the U.S. And then a very interesting trade that I can't say I did because I think it was more of an advanced trade that they just like told me not to do was Rio, Rio Tinto. It's a big mining company in Australia. Rio trades in the U.S., Australia, and London, um, but it's non-fungible, meaning, meaning you couldn't convert, uh, I think it was London shares to the U.S. market. So like London traded with Australia and the U.S. traded with Australia, but London didn't trade with the U.S. So like you couldn't, you couldn't convert it. And so there was a guy on our desk who was a, who was a real player and like, you know, a lot of money and who, who I'm sure is still trading a lot of money now. Um, but he was a spread trader and he would, and, and so there were brokers that would literally make a market on the fungibility of Rio and London to the U S and, and this guy, and this is my understanding again, this was so long ago, but he would literally trade the broker spread. So the broker spread would go up and down based on where he was willing to make a market on London versus Australia. And he would hold up and down and literally let the, you know, when the broker spread was way out, he would start building his position. And, you know, this guy would, he was, he was very smart and, you know, I'm sure he had excellent money management skills and, you know, he would literally play that spread. And there were a lot of guys that would play that spread, but, you know, they'd play that spread with like a one or two day approach. Whereas this other guy was like bigger picture, like, cause when that spread really paid, I think, so the firm ended up blowing up in 2011 when, uh, you know, the market sold off and particularly Australia mining stock stuff sold off. And I want to say that guy in the end ended up making a lot of money on that, even though he was down good when it blew out, but he was down. And he hadn't even really put his position on yet. You know what I mean? He was in his position, but he hadn't really put it on yet. And I want to say when that collapsed, he ended up making a lot of money. But so that was a trade. And then a little less so, but we would trade like Toyota, Sony between Japan and the US. And then probably one of the craziest days. And I and I was too scared to trade. I, you know, I can fully admit it. But when the tsunami happened in Japan, um, uh, Man, I'll never forget. There was this other crazy kid on the desk who who, who was uh, he was my age, but he was a freaking wild man. And I, I mean, he made a lot of money when the, you know for at the time for like a twenty three year old. I, I don't know how much, but like well into the six figures. I like you know high maybe high. I, I don't really know. But he he just loaded up Toyota right on the open of the tsunami open, and it like ripped. And I think he cashed out like fifteen minutes later. But, you know, when we ended up blowing up, you know, he got destroyed. Um, and, and you know, so I guess, you know, I got to witness a lot there. But in the end, I actually didn't make any money doing any of the international arbitrage stuff. I had followed, you know, one of my mentors into some stuff, you know, not the conservative one, the other one. Um, you know, when I first started to kind of try to learn. And the thing is, like, these guys were trading such bigger size um, that for me, like, what was small size for them, you know, I think I was down, like, 60 grand in, like, the first month. And it was, like, no big deal. But for me, it was a huge deal because, like, I had come from, like, losing 2,500 bucks in, like, four, four <laughs> to six months to now I'm down 60 grand and it's, like, no big deal. And, and you know, I was, and, and they were paying me a draw. Like this was a, this was a real firm. They were taking some risk on me. When they interviewed me, they, they, they thought that I had, you know, they could tell that I had studied, I'd worked hard and stuff. You know, they, they wanted to invest in me. Um, but I, but I kind of couldn't handle it. And, and I didn't really understand the trades I was putting on either. I was just literally following people blindly, which like, that's what they kind of wanted me to do. And, and I understand, and I understand why. Um, but I ended up finding this guy on Twitter. So then I got on Twitter and I, and I found this guy by the name of Trader Florida, who he still exists, but not in the way that, that he did at the time. 
And this guy, I still think, has got to be one of the greatest traders ever. Um, and he would go on to Twitter every night and just teach, like, short videos. He introduced me to William O'Neill. And the funny thing is my mother had bought me how to make money in stocks, like, a year earlier and had told me, like, hey, you know, if you're going to do this, you know, you should really read this book. And I think, like, I... It has like 1999 on the front. The one she gave me was a thin blue covered book, and I wish I I wish I still had it, but I, I don't know where it went. But you know, obviously, I have my copy right here. Um, but uh, but she gave it to me. I never really read it because it had the 1999 on the front. You know, you open it up. It's got like. 99 SMR rating, 90 R, and you're like, what is this stuff? Like, they're just trying to sell us all this, all this stuff. Like, you know, I'm reading about MACD and RSI. You know, I'm reading about the real stuff that's going to help you make money trading. Um, and so I never, I never read it. And then I run into this guy, Trader Florida, you know, probably a year later, and he's saying, you know, you got to get this book, 25% minimum earnings and sales. You know, stocks making new highs, charts, you know, cup and handle. You know, this guy would say, you know, charts are everything to me and, and, and volume. This guy, in, in now that I've been doing this a while, is what he really, really, really taught me about was volume. Volume is, is literally everything. Like, I, I don't know how anybody can trade the market without volume. Um, volume is like the key for me to everything. Um, and actually a guy who who's, who's become a mentor to me. One of the ways he scans the market is he covers up the charts. He just looks at the volume patterns and he's able to tell you where a stock's going to go based on the volume. And, 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 and it's, and it's, and it's definitely true when you learn to read volume, like, like the gates open up. Um, but either way, so I started following this guy on Twitter and I mean, I was going through his videos every night. I lived, I lived in a, I had a room in a house with like five roommates. They were all older than me. And I basically, you know, Sunday at like 8 PM is when like Japan and London opened. And even, even when I stopped kind of following these guys on ARB and I was more us swing trading, I was still their assistant. So I had to watch the London open at, or, or sorry, uh, the Japan open was eight with Australia and that would vary by like an hour between the two, depending on the time of year. And then, you know, because I had to sit there, you know, I was studying charts. I was, you know, I built up my repertoire of trading books. I was reading my books. I was studying the trader Florida videos every single night for hours, for hours. Like I think the people I lived with thought I was completely insane. They never saw me. And, uh, and, and you know, then I'd sleep for a couple hours. I'd have to get up for like the, the, uh, I guess, would it, would it have been the Japan Open at 1 a.m.? I can't even remember. And then I'd have to get up for like the London Open at 3 a.m. I'd have to get up for Arco Open at 4 a.m., you know, when the U.S. like free market traded. Because sometimes these guys would want their ARBs taken off at like 4 a.m., you know, or that's where there were huge outlier discrepancies. Because a lot of these guys, that's what they were doing, more trading like spread type stuff. So, the times when nobody else is watching is when there's inefficiencies, you know? Um, but because basically from Sunday at eight <laughs> until Friday at four, I was pretty much watching the market. Um, I was, I was, I was just stoking everything this guy had, had to say, you know, I'd be watching like the London open here and I don't like trade to Florida up here. And I mean, I was watching the sky for 16 hours a day. And, and I actually started to make some money, um, you know, not huge because one of my issues was I was so scared to lose money. That's how I always was starting out that I never really made that much money either <laughs> for two reasons. One, when I was right, my position size would be too small or two, I would kind of just have too tight of a stop. I'd get shaken out and then, and then, and then things would move without me. Um, but, but either way, I, I started making some good trades. I started making some um, progress. And I started to, you know, basically, even though I was getting a draw, you know, I had to make back what I lost before I was going to make any money. And then I would also have to make what they paid out on my draw before I 
you know, started actually getting in excess of that. Um, and I was kind of, and I was getting there. I, I can't remember exactly. Um, and I was really doing well. Like some of the stocks I was trading were names that I would have never traded prior to meeting Trader Florida because I would have thought they were too expensive. Like CMG at the time, I want to say was like a three to five hundred dollar stock. I would have always thought that's like too high priced. I can't trade that. But Trader Florida made me realize like those are exactly the names that you do want to trade um, because those are the names you know the institutions are buying. <laughs> Because, you know, little Joe Schmo retail trader who thinks you don't want to trade that won't trade it. So therefore, all the volume that's in that name is real, like it's real buyers and sellers. Um, and therefore, it's easier to kind of read a stock like that, um, which is, you know, how I sort of trade today. I, you know, I, the main name I've been trading the last few years is NVIDIA. It's like a $700 stock. Um, and the amount of volume that pours in and out of it is 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 just unbelievable um which for me the way i trade makes it easier to kind of read um, but i learned that from from trader florida and so you know to 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 make a long story short in 2011 i can't remember exactly what the catalyst was if it was rates or, or what it was but the uh, the markets you know we were, we were in a choppy range-bound market anyway but you know, we had like a flush out where commodity stocks in particular got hit. Um, things like Rio and BHP. And, you know, our firm got run over. And I, and I think some of them even just, you know, the way we were, the way I was taught when I was doing ARBs was like, you know, if you're going to put an ARB on, you know, you always have to hedge your edgy Aussie dollars. Just because when you open a position in one country and close it in, in another, you create a currency position, and then you have to collapse that when you close the position. And I want to say that rather than close their Aussies, <laughs> they doubled down. And so they were long Aussies, and then rather than sell Aussies to get you know down, they just said, oh, this is overdone, and they then bought Aussie dollars. <laughs> so I think in the end, you know, uh, and, and again, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly what, what all happened, but, um, you know, we got hit in the mining stocks, we got hit in the Aussie dollar. And, uh, you know, I think, I think those guys had done really well. And I say those guys, cause let, let's be honest, I was the smallest guy, whatever I was doing had like no effect on the, <laughs> on the bottom line of anything. Um, and actually, the day we went under, I'll never forget, I was short the OIH, the oil services uh, ETF, which at the time was much more tradable, I feel like, than it is today. Um, and I was feeling, like, really good. I, I want to say I can't even remember. I think I was going to make, like, six grand in a day or, or, or something like that. And, and I had a bigger day than that, but it was, like one, like, one of my biggest days. I was feeling really good. Like I, I knew when I came in, the market was breaking, like things were breaking wide open and I was feeling real, real good. Um, and then, and then, you know, maybe like 10 a.m. or 10.30 and, and, you know, knowing me at the time, because I'd probably, it was probably gone lower and I'd probably already covered a lot of my position just because, you know, I didn't have the holding power that I have now. Um, you know, they, they, Pull me into this little conference room quick and easy. Because remember, like when you're when you're trading from like uh, eight p.m. on Friday to four p or, or eight p.m. on Sunday to four p.m. on fr Friday, you end up spending a lot of time with these guys. Like even when you're not on the desk, you know you're at one of the guys' houses trading, and then you like go do something or whatever. Like you're kind of trading the opens and closes, and then you're kind of like always together all week. You know, not entirely, but spent a lot of time so like the guy that like you've been with all week brings you in and he's like hey you know we got absolutely drilled go close all your positions we're shutting everything down and you're like whoa what? like what wait i'm having like my best day or whatever and he's like yeah but your best day doesn't mean anything <laughs> but um, and and so where we're at like that was kind of for me i guess you could say the third time you know with the thing that happened when i was a kid and then, you know, my first prop experience, and this, that was kind of like the third time now where, where the market definitely got me. And uh, I was just like, 
god damn like i i felt like i was like starting to really learn like i was still very ripe like i, I want to emphasize that but i felt like i was starting to make progress i sort of had a sense as to what i was actually doing you know for like the first time you know maybe in that two to three month period and uh and i and i felt like i was developing a strategy you know um and then and then just you know gone job gone like you know figure it out <laughs> I, I i don't know i don't know what you're or whatever what's the saying you know you go somewhere you can't stay here or something like that that's pretty much how it was and you know i think we all like went out that weekend and then that was kind of like that was it you know and i was back to mom's house again <laughs> Right, but uh, before we continue, Oliver, you know, do you want to get some water first? Yeah, I got some water right here. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, you've covered a lot of ground, right? Your personal <laughs> life, your dad, your different, you know, trading methodology over the years. So now let's talk about maybe today, right? So what's your trading approach yeah. today? You mentioned a little bit from Trader Florida, I think the canceling methodology, right? So maybe you can yeah. share a little bit more. Yeah, so I uh it's really good ways. I've, I've, I, you know, I, I use charts pretty much entirely, and I utilize the ten and twenty period moving average, exponential moving average, and those are kind of my goalposts that I trade around. Then I use the fifty SMA as like, you know, a guideline. I don't trade off the fifty SMA though. Everything I do is around the ten twenty EMA. Um, and then like, I kind of measure whether a market's extended to a degree, you know, relative to the 50 day, you know, maybe the 200 day. Um, and then I use price structure. So I'm looking for stocks to kind of break out of little mini consolidations that are generally around the 10, 20 period moving average. Um, and I'm looking to ride the moving averages higher. And then I settle into what I call extensions. So kind of little extensions away from the 10 period moving average. Um, or if I don't get the extension right, I get stopped out when we lose the moving averages. Um, and then I'm also just looking at, so I do that all on the daily chart. You know, I, the daily chart is kind of my trading time frame, um, And I'm looking at the weekly to just kind of see the, the bigger picture. Um, you know, how big the base is, you know, how far do I think this thing can actually move? And then I really kind of, you know, I'd say I manage the trade in a way off the daily, but I watch the 65 minute chart to assess the higher highs and higher lows. So I am definitely like a price structure trader. And I would say a good way to describe my strategy, if I had to say it in, you know, one sentence, would say like, I'm a moving average crossover person, but I'm not really actually, but I'm looking to anticipate the changes in trend via the price structure. And it's what I mean by that is if I see a stock building kind of like a base and the way I differ from Can Slim, you know, they talk about like four to eight week bases, you know, I'm talking about, you know, four to 10 day little mini consolidations that might be within a, a bigger base, but I'm trading it off the, what I call the mini base. And once we kind of make that higher high or bust out of that, I like to get long with a stop below that. And then as long as we have higher highs and higher lows on the 65 minute, I stay long. And then I use the 10, 20 EMA as kind of like a filter. So for example, you may think that a stock's making a lower low, but if it's above the 10 day, I kind of say to myself, well, is it really a lower low? Or is this stock just, you know, taking a healthy, you know, breath of fresh air, letting the 10 day catch up, and then it reconfirms higher, meaning it makes a higher high. And then I know it has a higher low and that's the higher low I kind of manage my position against. And then if it goes up and it does the same thing again and it reconfirms again, I'll then move my stop up again. And I'm basically looking to ride the trend higher and then ideally sell into an extension. Now you don't always get an obvious extension. You know, sometimes you just kind of have a, uh, petering out in momentum. So for example, I caught this move in NVIDIA 
that started around like 495, 500. And I'm out most of my position here, you know, around, call it, I probably got out of most of it around like 732 or so. And one of the reasons being is it's a little extended on the weekly. I don't think it's done anything wrong at all. A matter of fact, I hope it pulls back so I can get get back a, a big position on it again. But it's moved enough and I've, and I've made enough and it's made higher highs and higher lows this whole time. And now we have earnings next week. And I don't like to take an enormous ar- amount of risk on earnings. Um, I will hold in earnings, but I, I like to kind of, you know, I've been in this thing for six weeks. We've made 40, 50% on our money. Now, I la- you know, I will hold a little bit in earnings, but probably about like one, one six or one seventh of my position, just because I want to kind of put that money in the bank. It's February right now, right? It's early in the year. And then if it gaps up and it's higher than where I sold it, I'll just let it set up again and then and then I'll get back on it, you know, when it sets up again and I feel like things have reset for me. So I don't necessarily care if I buy it higher. I just want to get get my setup and then play the trade and compound my money. So like if you know, I've had a pretty good start to the year here and and I do and I do use margin. So if I have a good start to the year. And then I can catch a second run. You know, I'm sort of, I'm hopeful that we can get a little chop here and then I can catch a second run before the election. I'll have more money to catch that second run and then hopefully catch a year end run. So I'm looking to utilize my strategy, but then could we just keep ripping higher here? Absolutely. Actually, I think the market looks really good, bigger picture, but there's a chance we, we come in. I see definitely see some some potential for that. And when I say come in, it might just chop around, you know, not necessarily come in. And I want to make sure that I kind of bank my money so I have the opportunity to compound it when I feel like the market is really freshly set up again, if that makes any sense. Like when we're coming out of a fresh base, you know, that's always where I'm going to have my most size is coming out of a fresh, you know, little mini base. Um, and then as we get more and more extended and there's more potential to give back, I want to have reduced out my risk and just and just kind of wait for, for, for that high probability play again. And that, that's I try to just do that over and over again. Okay, so from what I'm hearing is that you like to identify uh, stocks that are coming out of a consolidation, a base. Uh, what's the duration of the base that you said you were looking at again? So, I mean, it's sort of at this point, at this point, it's sort of like the well-trained eye, you know, like, so this weekly chart in NVIDIA had a lot of things going for it. And then it was like a, so I'm aware of like the bigger base. So for example, NVIDIA had like a six month base, right? So it was, it was very nice. But then the actual pattern that I ended up buying was really like a, a multi-day type pattern it you know it was like well i guess it was like a kind of a two-week what they call a double bottom base but then the way it's set up it's sort of built over like three to four days so it's kind of like a moon base inside of a a bigger base so like i'm i'm i'm, I'm combining time frames when i talk about these bases but as far as where i actually execute it was really only like a three to four day kind of mini base. Um, Could you maybe in, share the, the date? Yeah, so people can actually refer yeah, to the so, if they wish to. So the way that I think about NVIDIA is this base started in about August of 23. And okay. I had actually traded this stock through that rally. And then it basically consolidated between August and January. And, you know, I, I was taking some trades in this base um, and you know, some winners, some losers, but no trade that really significantly moved my capital, you know? Um, but so we had this, this big consolidation. And then if you're, if you're looking at the weekly chart, you'll notice that starting the week of 12, 18, we're, we're really in the week of 12, four, you know, we have kind of what I view as a weekly bull flag and we kind of push up out of it the week of 12, four. 12, 11, 
and then we resist at that you know 505 level the week of 1218 and 505 was important because that's kind of where we topped in on 821 and then the trade that i really got on with with pretty significant you know size was uh 1218 1225 and 1 1 those three weeks you can see that the the close of 1218 on the weekly was 488 and the close on 1 1 was 491 so over the course of three weeks we traded in a one percent range so we had a, a huge contraction in uh in volatility and then the way that i i saw that hold on the way that i saw that you know really really put me in on the daily chart was on 1229 we pulled back to start the year when the market did um one two we kind of had a shake out and then on one three and i'm a big relative strength guy so on one three um of this year the market was where's one three the market was was down you know i don't know it was my my ticker's not working great here but we were, we were down pretty good and then and then we were right again on one four and on one three nvidia actually closed higher than where it opened so it showed relative strength to um, the underlying market and then on one four we were up and the market was down and that to me right there within context of that bigger weekly pattern it was like two days in a row where the market was going lower and the video was going higher um and then the next day when we traded up through the high of one four i started getting along this thing you know in like the 485 area um and you know it went up to like 495 and it pulled back and and i actually i can't even see this now because my arrow really doesn't go back that far i'm just doing this by memory but on the 65 minute chart the way we traded up through 485 we had a nice little burst in the morning and then we built like a bull flag on the 65 minute chart in the afternoon um, and it looked really good and then the next morning i loaded up because uh, i already had a position from from a solid price which allowed me to get aggressive on that next move the next morning and so i was really i want to say i was buying 495 497 500 and i pay attention to the whole number for sure and so by the time we got to 500 you know i had a pretty significant position and then i knew 505 was the all-time high and so i bought a little more through 505 and then kind of by like the end of the day, I was like, wow, this, this thing's going to go. Cause like big volume was pouring into it and I already had a big position, but you know, until the close, you're kind of like, ah, is this thing going to hold, you know, but I, I felt good about it, but you just kind of like never really know. And then into the close, um, I bought a little bit more. Um, and basically I think is what I did is I brought my price up to a little under 500 and that was going to be about my stop so that's sort of what i try to do is i try to get a good size position on and i'm and i'm not always buying it once but i'm but i'm pretty aggressive when i feel like i've got it and this was an instance where i really really felt like i had this thing and it was just like clear to me and it's and, it, and for multiple reasons one you got the big weekly base so you knew that if it worked it was going to have the firepower to really move, you know, because you need that big, big base. But then the way that it showed like two days of relative strength and it started to kind of tighten up its base. So it had been like it had made a 20 percent down move from 500 to 400 and then it made a 10 percent down move from 500 to 450 and then it made maybe what, like a 5% down move from, you know, 500 to, you know, 475. So it had kind of contracted its base and was showing that the sellers were rejecting it at 500, but the buyers were supporting it at 400, then 450, then 475. And then in that little index pull-in to start the year, there were no sellers in the stock. 
you know, and you could just feel it getting ready to explode. I mean, literally, it gets me excited thinking about it. It's such like a beautiful thing. Um, and, uh, and I just, I just, I felt, I felt good about it and I went after it and, uh, you know, really this trade kind of, I feel like the trade is concluded for me now, even though I still have a little bit. Um, but it's a perfect example of, of what I try to do. Um, and it's a good example too, cause I actually still think this stock is going to go higher. Um, but it wouldn't shock me if it had some consolidation first and whether that consolidation uh, re-triggers higher or if it pulls back a little and I buy it a little bit lower is kind of irrelevant to me. It's just, I want to wait for that next consolidation and then take the next trade, um, whether it's higher or lower. You know, I've kind of made my money here and I hope I get it again at some point this year, you know. Okay, so I'll just do a quick summary right, in case the audience want to kind of like encapsulate what you've just said. So what I'm hearing is that, you know, NVIDIA was a trade you took early this year. You talk about the base quite a bit, right, from August 2023 to Jan 2024. It's kind of like a uh, an ascending triangle, right, if from the looks of chart, you know, classical chart patterns, you call this a, yeah, a series yeah. of higher lows coming to resistance. Right. And where you really got excited, I guess, was the consolidation got tighter and tighter right towards the tail end i think it's like just a bounce between 500 and 475 then somewhere inside you notice that there is relative strength in this stock as well in the indices were down maybe a couple of days in a row but this stock actually held up closing higher for the day so that shows yeah. you signs of strength and uh you probably entered on the lower time frame like the 65 minutes time frame to get an yeah. entry I heard you mention something like a flag pattern in the afternoon trading session. That's where you got your first entry and then you progressively scale up as the price, you know, should you, you know, it's working out in your favor. Kind of like sum it up, kind of like uh, the setup that you would love to trade over and over again. Yeah, I mean, this, this, if I could just trade setups like this and also in stocks like this, um, I really like stocks that are liquid. So like I know there's other stocks that can have a, bigger percentage move. Um, but I will put a lot of money in a stock like this, whereas like another stock that's maybe can move more and is less like, so like I caught the move at SMCI too. Uh, but because of the way SMCI trades, I am never going to have as big of a position, even though it had a bigger move. Because like, you know, it'll move like 10% in a day. And I like high beta, but I don't like insane beta. <laughs> okay. um, at least in a sizing perspective. Um, so it's the setup, it's in, and then it's the stock. And, and I think the key thing, the two key things I would say is one, like the, the, the bigger picture base was big enough. So that if it did trigger, it had the potential for a big move. And then the way the volatility within the base contracted would kind of be 0.2. And then a lot of the times in just about all of my big trades, you'll see like two days of relative strength before they launch. Um, mm, and nice. that is kind of the key, key tell that you have uh, your hands on a, on a, on a, on a big time situation. Um, and that's why I love, I love when the index goes down because I can really sniff out what's for real, you know? Um, Cause a lot of stocks go up when the market goes up and some of the stocks I would never want to own go up the most when the market goes up, but they also get destroyed when the market goes down. Whereas the real, the real, I don't want to say that. Yeah. Like that screw it. The real stocks, the ones that I want to own, they often have support under them when the market's weak. So uh, one of the things I learned from Trader Florida that he always emphasized is, is uh, you know, corrections are great as long as you don't ride them down. Um, like, don't be afraid of a correction or a pullback in the market. It is, it, is, it is putting on a silver platter for you exactly what you want to be focused on and what you want to buy. Um, so I love when the market goes down. I love it. Okay. And from what I'm I'm guessing, right, you won't often get such setups like this because it really needs time to build up you know, and stuff like yeah. that. So what do you do in the meantime if, let's say, 
you know, for a good period of the year, there's no such similar trading setups. Yeah, so like I can tell you right now, so like my mentality, I guess, going into this week is, um, I, you know, I caught this SMCI move. It was like a month and a half long move. I caught this NVIDIA move. It was like a month and a half long move. And some of the trades I made will be longer than that. You know, they might be like, like two and a half months, two months or something. Um, but sort of my mentality, even if we go a little bit higher here, you know, I, I, I don't really know, is to just kind of take things a little bit easier for the next, uh, I don't know, two or three weeks or something and just kind of see what happens here with this market um, and hope that I get a new round of setups. And I'm, you know, thinking at that point we could have another big move, maybe from like the middle of March to like, you know, June, July -ish or so. Um, and then, you know, I have other, you know, I've been in crowds since. When did I buy a crowd? I started getting into crowd at like 172. So I've been in crowd since September. Um, so, you know, NVIDIA, NVIDIA, I still think is, is going higher, but like my current trade has, you know, realistically nvidia could pull back a couple percent and i'll probably be back on it and it's you know it's like the same tr like trend but it's a different trade for me whereas you know other names that just move a little differently like i've been in this crowd for now sort of unbelievably like four or five months um so you know like i'm in other stuff too it's not just like i'm in i'm in one stock um so I have other stuff going on. You know, I have other stocks coming up right now that have earnings that'll kind of depend how, on how I build them. Um, I took a pretty big position in coin, you know, like a week ago or so, and it's moved pretty significantly. Um, and I'm sort of like, so for, for example, for that, like what am I doing in the interim? I'm hoping that'll rest for like two or three weeks and I can buy more because I, I think there's a chance it goes higher. Uh, not a, I, I feel pretty good it'll go higher but i just it's crazy stretched right here you know um so you know I'm, and, and and i'm and i'm studying other things like there's other stocks that have reported earnings recently that have ripped on earnings which i don't generally chase that stuff but i'm focused on that stuff to kind of chop down here and set up for me even if it's just like a week or two of chop um so like right now i have so many things like so many things that i'm paying attention to that I'm just, I'm not going to like chase right here, but if I can get a little bit of consolidation, I'll be all over them. And you know what, if they just, if they just keep ripping iron, <laughs> then I'll just kind of have to wait. Um, so like, like I'm even, even when I don't have like a big trade on or something, um, you know, I used to try to do stuff like, you know, like trade the shorter time frames and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm staying away from that one, because I think that, uh, I can't say I make massive progress doing that. You know, maybe I have a good day here, a bad day there doing some day trading. I make my money, you know, hitting my core trades when they're set up and, and, you know, putting, putting a lot of my account in those trades. Um, so I guess like my mentality is to stay focused on the big picture you know, understand we're six weeks into the year and that I'm, I'm, I feel like with the move we've had and how I think about the market here with it being an election year and, and just kind of how I, and how I'm seeing everything set up. Like, like last year it was just the big caps. Now I'm seeing so many other names, like have what I call weekly change of character bars. So I think at the beginning of every single move in a stock, you have a massive week of volume. Now, maybe that's an earnings report or some other form of catalyst of some sorts, but you have an enormous weekly volume, what I call a weekly change of character bar. And then to me, that usually means that that stock is going to be supported on dips and pullbacks. And obviously not always. Um, and sometimes it's supported, but it doesn't really accelerate higher. <laughs> It just kind of like doesn't go lower. So I want to hopefully try to position in the situations that get supported and then expand higher. Um, and I see so many weekly change of character bars right now. And I, and you know, I keep lists of them when they happen. So I don't necessarily always buy them when they explode, but I'm focused on those names 
as they consolidate and set up. So really right now, like literally going into next week or, or the week after, regardless of where the market goes, because I don't really care. I personally am so bullish on the market right now. But as far as how things are set up for what I can aggressively go after and buy, uh, just based on my strategy, I am sort of waiting for some of these things to build these kind of two to three week little mini bases of some sorts. And if that happens, uh, I think I'm going to have a, another, another, another pretty good run here. Um, so I have some, some positions on right now for sure. Um, but I am, I have many things that I'm watching and I have cash right now to, to put to work and I'm just kind of waiting for these opportunities to, to come to me where I can get them in a low risk position. That's, that's like, this is a good time for you to ask me that question. Cause that's literally what I'm going through right now, like heading into the week. Um, and you know, the names that I'm like really mentally zoned in on, you know, NVIDIA for sure. Um, I got to get through this earnings report. And then if it gaps up, if you look at January of 23, I think it's set up exactly like it is right now. Um, it pulled back into the 20 day a little bit before earnings, gapped up on earnings, and then it went sideways for two or three weeks. And I sold it last year and I bought it back maybe five points higher, but in a completely new setup with like a three week mini base. And so I would love if we saw something like that happen in NVIDIA. And if we did, I'll be all over it. Um, then I think this coin, I mean, coin just moved from like 120 to 190 in like eight days. I mean, that is, and, and really, I thought the earnings were really good, um, at least the way I was reading them. You know, a lot of people thought that the ETFs were going to crush coins revenues and coin had a great revenue number and they posted a surprise profit. And so I look at this thing and I say, you know, the 10 days at 150. So we're about 20% above the 10 day. I mean, if I buy there, <laughs> the chances of me being able to hold that position are, are, are very low. So I actually had a position from 130 and I sold a little bit on a uh, Friday. Actually, I sold a, a decent amount, but really that's kind of trade one for me. And I kind of took some profits on that. And now I'm looking to reload a second position on coin. I'm very interested in coin. Um, but I can't buy something 20% above the 10 day moving average. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Um, and then crowd, which is another stock I really, really like. Um, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm in, um, it has earnings. I believe I'm three, five. And PNW, Palo Alto Networks is another cyber stock that reports this week. And then Zscaler reports next, next week. And so I'm sort of just looking to kind of get through that on that position because I have it from so much lower and I, and I think it's going higher that I'm, I'm willing to kind of sit through some consolidation on that type of stuff. But really, I would like to get another position of that going. It, it, like mentally for me, it's a completely separate trade but I think it's one of the best stocks in the market. So rather than diversify down into like a, another name that I don't think is as quality of a name, you know, it doesn't have liquidity. It doesn't have the earnings and sales. It doesn't have the sector theme. So like kind of the themes for me this year are like AI, cyber, crypto, and then you're always going to have kind of these one-off names that maybe are a, uh, you know, they're their own theme. Um, but so those are kind of the areas of the market that I, that I'm focused on. You know, a lot of people are talking about oil stocks turning right now. Like I'm not looking to kind of chase that sector rotation. I'm just saying, okay, maybe some of my stuff's a little ahead of itself. I just want to be patient and let it set up again. Um, and, 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 you know, and I want to stay focused on my stuff. I don't want to miss the two days of relative strength before it goes because I'm screwing around with some financial stock or something that's going to rally like 10% in like three months. You know what I mean? I want to stay dialed in on, on my core names. Um, that's, 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 that's what I'm thinking. Um, yeah. So 
yeah, you mentioned relative strength, right, for two days prior to to the move, right? So how important is looking for that relative strength prior to the breakout? If you don't have that, do you still take, you know, the trade? So, like, yeah, I can't say that I don't. I mean, if the pattern's there, I will. Um, and, but it's almost like the, like, you get this conviction when you see that. That doesn't exist when you don't see it. And conviction equals bigger position. Um, and, and part of the reason bigger position is because when you're, when you're putting the position on, oftentimes the feedback you're getting is that, hey, this thing's for real. Um, just the market's telling you that. But then I'm a big believer that kind of in your subconscious, your subconscious senses that too, just from watching it trade for those two or three days where maybe you weren't even doing anything, but you were getting this feedback. Um, and then when it's time, when the trade triggers and the volume comes into it, that subconscious says, hey, you know, now, now's the time, you know, now's the time to go. Like this thing is, it, it let us know the last couple of days that it, that it was, you know, perking up. And today it is telling us, like, we are ready to go. Um, and so, you know, like, so there, there's like a couple, there, here's an example of a name right now that had a big earnings report. And I think it had a big move, but right now it's, it's it, it it seemed like it might have wanted to continue last week, but it, it kind of failed Friday. If you ask me, Palantir, pretty popular name. It had what I consider to be a weekly change of character bar, I guess the week before last. And right now, if we were to kind of chop around and then at some point have those like two days of, of relative strength, like if it continued to build out this pattern, like I'm projecting myself on the future right now, which is not something I, you know, do, but I'm just saying like, if that scenario played out, I think it would kind of have the pattern to act on something like that. So it's like the relative strength, like within context of like the overall bigger picture. So it's not just like, you know, some random piece of relative strength, like in the middle of nowhere. It has to do with like the theme of the stock, the, you know, the overall bigger picture. Um, you know, it all kind of comes together. I, I, I don't know how to describe it a hundred percent, but, but yeah, seeing that relative strength, I, I find is, is, is often very present before a stock really kind of moves. Um, and you know, you need that consolidation too, you know, like, like, you know, if a stock stretched from the 10 day or something and it's stronger than the market, you know, that's much different because <laughs> it's like, I, how do I manage my risk there? You know? Um, whereas I, I'm sort of talking that subtle bit of relative strength kind of within a base, um, which I don't even think Palantir is quite there yet where you could, like, you know, if it kind of channeled down a little for a couple of days, set up a little more, and then that were to happen, it would be very meaningful to me because you kind of have like a big week up, a, you know, week last week that was tighter. And then if you got like two tight weeks, you know, now you got three weeks of mini base and then you start to see that signal, then you can really pay attention because you got the weekly change of character, you got the rest, and then you're kind of getting that signal that strength signal in a, in a in a position where the stock's not extended you know whereas if it actually you know a stock can 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 be really strong and look good but if it's extended you know it might kind of move for one day and then kind of act a little sluggish you know so so it's got to be at the right time all right so i hear you mention this thing called the weekly changing corrector bar so maybe could you expand on it not quite familiar with it well, it's just, it's really just like big volume. So I, I call it a change of character. And I'm just a big believer that if you go study a lot of, you know, I hate to use the word like leader or whatever, but a lot of names that move, they have significant moves. You know, often if you really go study specifically the weekly chart, if you go study their weekly bases, you'll notice that there's an enormous amount of volume prior to that name really, really taking off. Um, so here's a name that we can look at that I'm watching right now that was probably a buy last week, but 
if you were to go look at this stock uh, APP, and I'll, I'll point out a couple things to you in this weekly. And, and this, right. thing is, this thing is short-term extended right now for, for the way I trade. Um, it, it wouldn't shock me if it just kept moving higher. But notice the week of 2.6, there's there's a lot of volume. And, and you know, it's still in a weekly downtrend. So it's kind of like, I'm not going to buy that. But with where we are now, I'm like, oh, you know, maybe that's where they started buying this thing. And then it goes through a couple of months of tight trade. And then on 5.8, you see big volume again. And then 5.15 week, you see big volume again. But in reality, that was kind of like the change of character. But just kind of with how the weekly is so beat up, that is not something that I'm going to buy. But then notice the week of 8.7. I mean, it does a lot of volume. A lot of volume. And then it goes into this multi-month consolidation, you know, just like that NVIDIA pattern. You know, this thing basically started to build the space the week of like 9-4. So it's been in about a five-month base. And even within that base, look at the week of 11-6, massive volume. And that's a big up bar. And then the volume sort of tapers off. And then very recently, we saw, you know, more subtle increases of volume the week of 122, 129. And then this week, we absolutely explode. Um, Let's see, 36 million, 36 million. On the the second highest volume week ever, but only only about 400,000 shares off the highest volume week ever in the history of this stock. And really, like a lot of people will buy this gap up. And I would buy that gap up in a more liquid stock in a name like NVIDIA. But this stock app is very, it can be very volatile. And so I'm just, here's the deal. If I had bought this gap up, I would have bought a small position. I would not have bought a big position because I would I would have been scared that this thing's going to like flash down because it's not liquid and I'm going to get smoked, you know? But now that it's supported itself, even if this goes higher here, which like, you know, it it probably will, at some point in time, at some point in time, whether it's, you know, next week or a month from now or whatever, this is probably going to have a multi-week consolidation. And it's going to let the the 20-day catch up. Hopefully it even consolidates to the point where it lets the 50-day get a little closer. And I will be on this stock when that happens. I don't know, again, I don't know if it starts to happen now or if it happens a month from now, but because of these volume signatures that are, you know, have been occurring on the weekly and specifically this past week where it just did enormous volume. um, Yeah, I sort of think that what I would consider to be a change of character was the week of eight, seven, you know, to me, I know it did more volume before then, but it did about 36 million shares that week. And it also had kind of established more of an uptrend, whereas, you know, the volume on the lows could have been shorts covering who just absolutely crushed it. But now that we had rallied from, you know, let's just say 10 bucks up to 30 bucks, the guy doing that volume is probably a real buyer, you know, not a short cover. He's probably a fresh buyer in the name. And then you sort of see, Think about think about that week of eight seven. The close that week was thirty eight eighty nine, and now think about the week of eleven six where we did that enormous volume. The open that week was thirty nine thirty six. Right about the close of that other big volume, I'd be willing to bet you it's the same buyer you know, kind of supporting his price. So we didn't get into this, but after after I, uh, you know, did the thing at the firm, I went and became an institutional, like basically a sales trader, but I was what's called an outsource trader. And I traded for like a fund that didn't want to hire a trader. They hired us and, we, and they prime brokered with us and we knew their portfolio and we knew the positions they wanted. And so there were situations you know, one very high profile growth stock that a lot of people would know. I bought millions of shares of this thing over the course of, you know, over a year. Um, I bought hundreds of thousands of shares of this thing a day. And I got to understand 
you know, how, so this could be one buyer that I, I, I want to, I, I would say it's more than one just because of the amount of volume it's doing, but there's definitely, definitely with how I see the week of eight, seven and the week of 11, six, there's definitely somebody, the same guy, I, I would, I would bet money on it. who's building a big position in this thing. And then, so they reported earnings this past week. That's why it gaps up. That earnings day confirmed for him. Well, he already knew, or, or he didn't know. They, they never know. Um, but I bet you he bought a bunch of this thing on the open, on earnings, and he's going to continue to buy this stuff for months. Um, and, you know, look, do I, do I know that for a fact? Absolutely not. Um, but I feel like that's that that with my experience in, in building positions for some for some big funds that when they got on a growth stock early kind of how they built their position um and you know a lot of these guys like think about it this is a what's the market cap on this thing i i don't know it's like probably in the you know it's probably under 20 billion or something you know they probably think this thing's going to like 100 billion or, or, or you know even if they think it's going to like 80 and they don't think like us, like, hey, I'm going to use a, a 10% stop. They're thinking, I run, and you know, I'm not even talking the mutual funds. I'm talking like a, a good sized hedge fund. I run $3 billion. For this position to matter to my portfolio, I have to buy uh, $300 million worth of this stock. You know what I mean? Therefore, at 60 bucks a share or whatever, I've got to buy like 5 million shares, which anybody who's traded this stock, even if I did 36 million, you know, on this day, you're not just like going in and buying 5 million shares of this stock. You're just not. Um, it just, there's just not enough liquidity. So they're probably buying three or 500,000 shares. And really, actually, they're probably, they're probably buying, you know, a lot more than that. Um, and they're not the only one, you know, if they're on it, there's someone else on it. And, and so, you know, it takes them weeks to buy it. Um, and I want to let them get a bunch of it. And then what are they going to do? At some point they're going to say, okay, we've been buying this thing for like three weeks. Let's take the week off. So, you know, uh, Michael, core portfolio manager, his daughter's getting married. You know, let's just like stop buying it this week. I'm not saying that's what happens, but you know, something like that. But then it, it might come in a little and they're looking at their average price for sure. And they want to, I don't know if they view it like they want to defend their price, but they're looking at like the last price they bought it at. And they, and I think they kind of view it like, oh, well, you know, we bought some at like, 56, you know, it went up to 65. Now it's back at 56. Like this is like a pretty good area to start picking away again. Let's view up some over the course of the day and just, just pick away. And then, and, you know, and then, and then we'll get aggressive again next week, but let's buy like a couple hundred thousand a day this week. Like that's like what I witnessed. And I think that's kind of how that, you know, it has the big move up and then they kind of support it. But they're they're usually not done. They're just like kind of supporting me and buying a little because like they they need to buy a lot more, so they they just buy a little, and that's kind of what builds that little mini two to three week base or whatever that I talk about. But then you get the guys like me who are on it, and then they're obviously I don't even know the short interest on this, but I just know the type of name. There's definitely still shorts in this thing. And then they realize like, oh crap, like we have to start to get more aggressive. People are starting to notice our stock. We found it first, like we know the story, we know it all well, we gotta make sure we get enough of this thing. And, and I think we're seeing a lot of stocks where we're entering a better market. We had the big caps kind of led year one off the low. And now we're seeing money flow into the small mid caps because the market is, people are kind of starting to believe in the market. So they're starting to take on more risk. And I think we're going to see more situations like that, um, that, you know, for someone like me, if I can spot these change of characters where I can find that big buyer, and then if I can, 
you know, look, I, I am always do it right. You know, I, I sometimes I think I got it right and I get stopped out, like actually more than I do get it right. But if I can get a couple of them right, where I kind of pick up on that little consolidation and get on board for the trend, you know, if I can get a couple of them right and, and, and you know, maybe get three or five, you know, really good names in a quarter, you know, that's that's all I need. So that's that's what I kind of mean by that weekly change of character is to really spot that huge buyer in the stock and understand he can't get everything he needs, you know, in a month. He's going to probably be supporting that thing, you know, unless something fundamentally drastically changes in the name. Um you know, then he might become a seller. <laughs> you know, then that's when you got to watch out. Um, but that huge volume on the weekly, it, it is often not a one week thing. Even if you don't see the huge shot of volume again, like that initial time, he's probably still in there, you know, picking away. Um, and that's great because it, 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 it provides support where a small guy like me can find a spot is really how I think about it is spot the spot, the volume, spot that change in character, and then just try to find a spot. And sometimes it takes a couple tries, you know, sometimes it takes three or four times. Um, but until you see that stock really do something really, really wrong, you know, where big volume comes in on the sell side, um, yeah, you, know, you, you just kind of, as long as it's acting healthy, you, you, you keep trying to give it a go. Um, at least that's, you know, how I, how I approach it. Nice. That was a really good explanation of the weekly uh, change in character. For those of the audience listening and you, there's no charts provided, just, you know, just do some, don't be lazy. Like go to trading view, plug in the dates, yeah. right? The ticker that uh, Oliver has mentioned, which is the APP app, right? Uh, during the, yeah. the dates that he shared earlier and give, pretty much see what it's saying. Yeah. So yeah, Oliver, another question I, th I think says, I'm curious that earlier you spoke about uh, NVIDIA, right? You, was it NVIDIA? Yeah, I think NVIDIA, you mentioned that you exited most of your position and then you are also in crowd. And as I was looking at both charts earlier, they both, the move, right? The magnitude both seems pretty good, right? All basically broke out higher. But yeah. for crowd, I haven't heard you, you know, talking about exits yet or have you really exited a certain of the position for crowd? So, so Cloud's a little unique in that sort of the two names that really like were the first kind of liquid moving names of this, you know, I sort of think that this rally started or like phase two of the bull market or whatever you want to call it sort of started at the end of October or, or, or November 1st when we came out of this correction. And the two names that to me were the, the leading names are crowd and meta. So if you actually were to go look at crowd, crowd tried to break out on October 6th. And I was actually long crowd on October 6th. And I felt really good about it. It had big volume on the six or, or sorry, on the fifth in or the fifth is, is when for me it broke out. Um, it had big volume, the fifth, big, or, or sorry, the six, the six, I'm sorry. And then big follow through on the ninth. And I was like, oh man, I nailed this thing. Because time when we get to October, I like the month of October. There's often a lot of bottoms in October. And then it just kind of couldn't get going. And, you know, it kind of rolled back over on the 19th, the, the 20th, the 21st. I think I ended up selling this thing like the 25th. And I was like super disappointed. Um, you know, I think I, I think I made a couple points, but it was kind of one of those things where when I bought it, I was like, oh yeah, I got my hands on something good, you know? And then, and then I ended up selling it for a few points and I remember just kind of being a little bit like, damn. Um, but then it's what happened is it, is it came down and it tightened up below the moving averages again. And when the market bottomed on, a, so this thing had an inside bar on 1027. So an inside bar is just like when, when the day trades inside the trade of the previous day. And it's kind of like a micro uh, view on contraction and volatility. You know, it tightened up versus the previous day. And then the next day in 1030, it was inside the bar of 1027. So I call that double inside. 
and when I see double inside, I'm like, all right, especially on a name that I like, you know, especially on a name that I like. And I got it on, on it again on like 1031, kind of the day before the market kind of moved. The, the market had, you know, the market had not wanted to go down anymore, in my opinion, on like 1030, 1031. But it also, I wasn't sure if it wanted to go up. <laughs> But that, but then I log and run. I I knew it wanted to go up, and so the thing is, Proud really started its move on ten six, but the market held it back, and same with Meta. And unfortunately, I was long Meta the same way I was long Crowd, and I didn't get Meta back, um, the way I got Crowd back. Which, you know, now I'm trying to figure out how to get into Meta all the way up here. Um, so it proved to be a pretty big mistake on my part. Um, but the way that I was able to get in crowds so early, you know, by the time the video broke out, you know, crowd was already up like a hundred points, uh, 50%. And the market was at a completely different, like the underlying index was at a completely different point in its, in its rally. Whereas right now, Look, I don't, I don't really know what the market's going to do, but, but I can see the market kind of consolidating here more, or maybe kind of go up a little more, but you know, in a little bit more of a choppy fashion. Kind of when we get to the way I said it, like October, when we get to like mid February ish, maybe you know, late February, sometimes early February you usually get some sort of seasonal correction. So that's, that's partially playing into, to what I'm doing a little more, I, I, I guess. Um, so Nvidia broke out later, whereas crowd right now, like if crowd, if crowd pulls back, you know, 10% or something like, you know, it just doesn't affect me that much. Um, I have taken some off, like, you know, I do reduce a little bit, but because of where I was able to get crowd, it's been a pretty easy trade for me. Um, just, just, and it's nice to have like crowd to me, doesn't move the way NVIDIA does. It's a little bit slower of a mover, but it's nice to kind of have that kind of core name in your account. So like, if you look at crowd, it's basically gone up the 20 day moving average. Whereas NVIDIA has kind of been a straight line up the five day, but now NVIDIA could pull back to the 20 day and I could be buying it back off the 20 day. So I could buy it now as a pullback versus like a whole big base, like it was originally. Um, but it's, it has to do with in the kind of index market cycle. I was able to get long crowd versus NVIDIA didn't break out for, you know, another two months. Um, and, you know, I was already up 50% in crowd. So that's part of, and then, and then overall, I, 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 I bigger picture, like when I look at the weeklies and the monthlies on the market, I, I like how the market looks and because of where I'm long crowd and also because of kind of the personality of crowd that it's a little slower mover. Um, just for me, you know, and, and similar to NVIDIA, I've traded crowd a lot, like a lot. And, uh, I'm just very comfortable with it. You know, I, I don't know if that makes any sense, but, um, you know, like for example, I'm on some other stocks that like I'm less comfortable with. So I've way smaller positions. Like I'm, I'm on like snow, snowflake, way smaller position. And, you know, when you have a way smaller position, it's also easier to kind of give things room naturally. Um, but the way I trade in the video, in the video where I'm in, it is usually my biggest position. And so therefore, you know, I, I kind of take my hits on it and then I, and then I get back on it. Um, but like me, my, my kind of runner on the video might be like as big as my snow position. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that's a good answer at all, but that's like what I do. So, you know, yeah, I'm sorry if that's not the best answer in the world. 
I can understand right? because coming from a discretionary trading standpoint, not everything can exactly be quantified, right? For a you know quantitative trader, unlike a quantitative trader, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it yeah. basically comes down to, I mean, crowd broke out two months before Nvidia, so I just have a a huge cushion on it. All right. And by the way, Oliver, uh, right now we're approaching the two-hour mark and I want to be respectful of your time. Yeah. So uh, how do you feel? Do you feel that you still want to go on? Or for you... maybe like another 30 minutes or so. Sure, let's do yeah. another 30 minutes. All right. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, for sure. I'm enjoying This is like a different type of interview, so I'm actually I'm enjoying it a, you know, a lot more. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that, right? So maybe let's kind of like talk a little bit about NVIDIA. You mentioned it. It had a huge run out and you know if there's a pullback right you might be looking to enter so maybe let's kind of like go into the specific you know what exactly are you looking for on a pullback before you enter a trade let's say for nvidia if it makes a pullback sure so look i'll just i'll just talk about kind of what i'm thinking on the video right now um because okay. like, that's the easiest way it's just to all right you know, for me to think about it so when i look at the video i'm right now it's currently sorry yeah, so, so for the audience who are wondering, right now it's uh, currently February 2024, 20th yeah. February 2024. Yeah. So that's kind of like, because sometimes they look at this sure. as one year later. So put things in perspective. Yeah, please go ahead. Sure. So, and I'll, and I'll try to use dates as I, as I described this. So when I thought the movie in um, 2023, and the way 2023 worked out is we, we broke out, you know, like one six, one nine of January of twenty. Sorry, Oliver. Maybe instead of one six, you can say like you know six of January. So they kind oh, of like yeah. understand whether. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. January and then the ninth of January. And what we did is we kind of ran on it, and it's funny looking at this now. The move looks like so small, um, but at the time this was a move from one fifty to two thirty, which is about a fifty percent move. Very similar to right now literally almost the exact same move and then what happened is i actually i actually exited my position in a similar way i exited the entire position and we kind of turned back to the 20-day moving average into earnings and so on february 23rd of uh 2023 we had earnings and we gapped up off the 20-day moving average you know, about uh, 10% or so, which at the time seemed like a massive gap. And I look at it now and it's like, it's barely anything. And then what happened is we went sideways. So, so the market was in a correction then. The, the index is corrected. I want to say, I don't remember the exact dates, but the index is corrected from maybe the first or second week of February of 2023 until like the second week of March of 2023. And so NVIDIA reported earnings in the middle of a correction and it gapped up and it went sideways for about three weeks. And what did it do? It came down into the 20 period exponential moving average on 313. So the 20 period moving average is sort of like my, I like to buy off the 20 day if in a situation like this where stocks acting, acting well. Um, and then importantly, it never filled that gap up. So I love it when stocks don't fill their gaps. So I call, I say, uh, you know, big gap up equals the street is caught off guard. And it's what I mean by that is, you know, Wall Street was expecting X number of earnings. NVIDIA reported Y. And the reason NVIDIA didn't report the gap is because Wall Street needed to buy shares. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, they were like, oh, crap, you know, we underestimated this thing. Um, and then, so I started getting long this thing again right in there, you know. And I, sh I sh you know, I, look, I tried to get long this thing, um, you know, like the day or two after earnings, and it just t didn't kind of work. I got out of it. I know that I tried this thing on 3-2 when we supported on the 10-day, and it went up, and it just kind of didn't have power, and I, and, I, and I got out of it for a scratch. But then, you know, try number three, like I said, sometimes it can take a couple tries. Um, I got I got in it there and it, and, it, and it worked again. And so sort of my mentality on the video right here is, uh, you know, now in, uh, it, you know, it's February 19th, 2024. Tomorrow will be the 20th of February. I look at NVIDIA and it broke out of a six month consolidation um you know at the start of the year and 
to me, this is what I call a stage two base. So anyone who's read William O'Neill, stocks kind of move in bases, you know, you know, third stage, fourth stage. And the first base in January of 2023, you know, was a stage one base that ended up being a large inverted head and shoulders pattern that was like an eighth month pattern. And then the second pattern was like a six month, you know, I think you called it like a, uh, a semi triangle, you know, whatever you want to call it. It was, it was like a, a six month consolidation and we've moved about 50% and we've really haven't had any pullback here. And so my mentality going into earnings is I'm going to, I'm different because I am trying to work on kind of holding positions a little longer. So I am actually going to hold a piece of this, this time, uh, about one, six, one seventh of my position. Um, Whereas the first go around, I'd cashed it all in and I got back in. Now I'm going to hold some because I'm, because I'm, I just want to, you know, try to work on that. Um, and if it, if it were to kind of gap down on earnings, I will just let it find support, you know, wherever that may be. You know, does it, does it, does it pull back more than I expect and come all the way back to the 50 day? Like that would be much more than I expect, but it's possible. Does it pull into the 20 day and then support and take some time to base out? Whatever it does, I'm going to wait for that. And then kind of, if it, if it gaps down, I probably won't go as aggressively as if I find a gap up situation. But if it gaps down, I'll kind of get it started again. Maybe get that one six one seventh up to like a 50, you know, half of what I had. And then if it worked up from there and it set up again at these highs, then I would look to, to really run back to it. So that would kind of be my gap down scenario. Now, my gap up scenario would literally be just like, uh, what was it, March of 2023, where we gap up, we kind of go sideways a little, and then, and then we set up and, and go higher. And so, you know, Look, we still have earnings on Wednesday evening, so we still have two days here. I would love to see this thing pull back. Love to see this pull back. And part of it to, to start the week, going into earnings. Um, because one of the things that I think, if you look at the weekly chart on NVIDIA, so the week of February 12th, 2024, last week, it has a doji candle. And it's a doji candle that the same way I use the 10 and the 20 and the, the daily, I look at the same thing on the weekly. Um, and I also look at the 5 EMA on the weekly, which the 5 EMA is just about the 20 EMA on the daily. Like they end up being about the same thing. And I think if you go study a lot of big moving stocks, they often hold the 5 week and they often hold the 20 EMA for that intermediate term multi-month move. So I would love to see this thing pull back. Like, um, you know, if this is like, Nivini is a stock that like, not that many people are on it at the beginning of the move, but then everybody was like, everybody loves it and it can't go down right now. And then, you know, everybody's gonna hold it in their hands because, you know, they're gonna be the next one in the meal or whatever. But then, but then it, that's a little bit of weakness, you know, the day two before they all change their mind and, and they all sell it. So I would love to see that happen here and get this thing closer than 20 EMA like it did last year. And if it does that, honestly, what I'm thinking is that if it does the same thing, do I have to back a little more of what I took off before earnings? I'm not sure about that, but that is something that I'm considering if it plays out that way. Um, but if it were to pull back and then gap up on earnings, the nice thing is that even if it were to gap up, it won't be so extended from the 20 day. And and then if it can consolidate a little, it'll have a really nice setup. It would be ideal if it did kind of what it did last year. And I think we're set up to where that could happen. Um, and then obviously, you know, the, the earnings have to come in good, obviously. Um, but I, but I think if we were to kind of, let's just say that we were to break higher here, um, you know, tomorrow or, or, you know, Tuesday or whatever, I sort of feel like with where the weekly is and stuff, if that were to happen, which I actually, I, I don't think that's going to happen, but if it were to happen, 
then I sort of feel like whatever the number is, it, it might gap down. <laughs> um, but I'm sort of thinking, you know, if I, if I had to make a prediction here, I'm sort of thinking that it chops maybe a little lower into the number. Um, and then, and then we'll see what the number is. And I'm hoping for a gap up because I, I just find stocks a lot easier to trade cleaner when they gap up and they don't have any resistance. Um, so even if I buy it back higher, I don't really care. It'll, it'll just be another, it'll be round two, you know? Um, and, uh, but that's what I'm hoping. I'm, I'm hoping we get a little pullback here. I think that would make sense just kind of based on how it's trading. Um, I think, you know, if you, if you were to pull up a 65 minute chart, which is what I look at, it's kind of lost some momentum here since that, uh, February 12th high. So I look at these things called like broadening resistance lines. They're, they're just like trend lines I draw. I think there's kind of an art to it. Um, but the day of, I guess it would be 24. I don't have, unfortunately, they don't show me the dates in my 65 minute, but I think on 124 and then it must be like February 5th and then February 12th. There's like a line that connects those three. And on the 65 minute, I can see it, you know, very clearly. Kind of once we hit that broadening line on the uh, 12th, you know, we've sort of lost some momentum and we're almost kind of cramming over a little into the close on Friday, which sort of makes me think we could get a little bit of a pullback here. Um, you know, that I, I don't trade that setup. So if it happens, like it's not something that I'm going to be involved in. Um, but it sort of makes me think there's a, there's a chance that that could happen before earnings. Um, but that's what I'm looking for. So gap down. I'll kind of let it settle. I'll be like less interested in really getting involved on a gap down, even though I think it'll get supported. It's just less what I'm comfortable with. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll kind of look to put some back on kind of when it pushes up. And then if it kind of gets back up into the highs again, that's when I would would look to, to really get, get back on it. Um, you know, you know, really add back what I had. And then if we gap up, Depending, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll depend kind of what happens to start the week. But if we, you know, just because it'll it'll affect how extended we are on 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 the report if we gap up. Um, but if we gap up, you know, I'll likely be looking for some sort of little mini consolidation in, in the range of maybe you know maybe one to three weeks. Um, and it'll also depend, you know, if the index is correcting or if the index is going higher. You know that'll likely affect how the Nvidia pattern builds out after earnings. Um, so there's there's some variables, um, you know, but but that's generally my thought process. Um, and then I just have to kind of wait and see how it plays out and try to do my best to position the right way. Okay, so let's say for example, just one example. Let's say Nvidia you get up, all right, and then it starts to consolidate for maybe two to three weeks. So maybe relative strength, it looks pretty good, right? Relative to the index and you're looking to enter now. So do you really enter based on the daily time frame or is it more on the 65 minutes time frame? Yeah, like the 65 minutes. So I will look for, uh, I, I, I keep the uh, 65 minute 20 EMA and then I keep the five. So like I'll keep the five, 10 and 20 days from the daily time frame. I, I chart that on my 65 minute. And I find that, um, the 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 sixty five minute twenty EMA and then the five day they they can sort of like perennial price and be a good area to just kind of see how things tighten up against um, and so I'll, I'll I'll be raising that and looking just for like a traditional pattern that you would see on the daily I'll just be looking for that to build on the sixty five minute. You know, whether that be a little mini bull flag, you know, an inside bar that then breaks higher. Um, I'm doing the same thing on the 65 minute as I would on the daily. It's just you get more buyers on the 65 minute. So, you know, what takes a month to happen on the daily, you know, might happen in a couple of days on the 65 minute. But it's it's within that daily pattern, you know. Um, so it's just kind of marrying up the time frames and and 
and trying to find a spot. Got it. And what about, I think, stop loss? Where would you then decide to set your stop loss for your first position? Yeah, so it, you know, I'm going to do it based on where I get involved on the 65 minute, which is part of the reason, you know, like when I gave that example on the app earlier where I said, you know, I could get smoked on this, it's because I don't really have like a, a, a stop there. You know, I, I'm not the best at buying huge gaps, even though I know that's become a very, very popular strategy. And, you you know, you buy the gap, put the stop at the low of the day. I mean, everybody makes it look so easy, but I've, I've, I've found in practice it's, it's not as easy as they all make it look. Um, Whereas I prefer to kind of let the stock move up on the 65 minute and then kind of let it pull back and buy a higher low on the 65 minute. I like to kind of buy, you know, when things are calm, you know, I don't want to be chasing the gap. But I want to be looking for the calm pullback where I can buy some. If it goes up, I say, oh, okay, maybe I'm onto something here. And then, you know, I can, I can buy a little more on maybe the next pullback. Um, and then when the stock really lets me know, then I can, can really go after it. Um, but that's, yeah, I, 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 I like to use the 65 minute to manage my risk by when I buy, I can keep a technical stop below those bars. Um, so I'm often putting my stops based on the actual bars on the 65 minute. Um, and I'm kind of using the moving averages as a, as a guide for me. Like, hey, you know, this 65-minute bull flag may look good, but it's like 3% above the five-day. So, you know, even if it looks good for an hour or two, you know, you're probably going to get shaken out because it's just it's just too extended. So I try not to buy too extended from the moving averages. Right. And also, I think we touched a little bit about exits earlier, but, you know, let's say you enter, you set your stop. So what about exits? Maybe, you know, where do you, like, usually start to unload maybe a portion of your positions? Yeah, so... Uh, Depending, so like in a video, I will trade like pretty big. Um, and then what I'll do is if it, if it really gets moving for like a week or two and it gets a little stretched just because of the, you know, I put, I put a lot more of my account on that than any other name. I'll, I'll feel like a fade off just because like I made a pretty good profit on it. And then I've still got a big position. Like still, it's usually still my biggest position, even when I take that third off. Um, and then I'll kind of let the remaining part uh, trade. And so actually this rally in NVIDIA, I had been take, I took like a third off at 700 or so. And that, oh, oh no, no, it wouldn't have been 700. It would have been like six, six twenties, six twenties is where I sold that third. So it was about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It was about, you know, 11 days, 12 days into its trend. I took about a third off. And that is what I ended up doing is it consolidated for five or six days and it built a mini base and I started a second position <laughs> and, <laughs> nice. and so I had two times my first position and then I had a second position and it's what I did with the second position is into that brand world area. I took about half of the second position off because I knew the second position is starting later so I wanted to take more than a third you know um and then, and then I basically had like two thirds of my first position and half of my second position. And then, you know, when I started to realize that the momentum was running out, I, the last like two or three, two days, I, I started reducing, you know, that, that kind of piece. Cause I was hoping it would just kind of keep going. But then when I realized like, okay, they've gapped it up twice and they've sold the gap open, you know, they might be done buying it until after earnings. Then I then I started to to reduce my position. And now mentally for me, like I said, even though I have some, it's kind of like over for me. And now we're like, all right, how can we game plan for after earnings? And the piece that I have left, you know, I will be a little bit more uh kind of like I'll see sort of like that crowd position where I'm gonna I'm gonna use the twenty day more on it and I'm gonna give it a chance to really ride that twenty day. You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll give it a chance to pull back 10% or, or whatever. Um, just because, you know, I've, I've taken, I've taken my money out of it and, and, you know, these things can go further than you think. 
Yeah. So you mentioned that you I think you exited the first position around six twenty. So what were there like any patterns or clues that you know made you want to exit a portion at around six twenty? I mean, part of it was just like you know I want to sell that third. You know, at a I want to make a pretty good profit on it. Um, that's that's sort of like like it. Um, and you know, you had that little tail on January twenty fourth, which that to me is not at all like, hey, this thing's going to reverse. It's just like, hey, on this first third, you know, this is probably a pretty good spot. You know, it's, you know, it, it, it's not as much of like a, a huge signal as it is like, you know, I want to make sure that I that I book some at a solid price. Um, and then I've got plenty left to, you know, ride. And, you know, I trade in the video a little bigger, whereas like something like, like uh even crowd i take bigger positions but not like nvidia but like something like snow or something where i treat it more as like a just normal size position like i'm not doing anything there i'm i'm just kind of letting that chop around and i'm riding it up the 10 day or the 20 day um and and, and you know a lot of people ask me this question so i'll, I'll just kind of ask it for you is you know how do you know whether you use the 10 day or the 20 day? And the answer is that uh, a, a good book that I recommend reading, this book, you know, Trade Life and Real Disciple. Uh, I really like this book. You know, they talk about it, like, get like, I can't remember the exact, you know, time frame, but sort of is what I do is when the stock gets like, you know, maybe four to six weeks into its move. And, and really the way that I judge that is if it's kind of had two pullbacks, um, you know, did it pull back and find support on the 10 day or do it pull back and find support on the 20 day? Like what is the character of the name? You know, some names move quicker and they hold the 10 day. Some names move slower and they hold the 20 day. And then the other thing I'll do too is for example crowd is a great example of this for the majority of crowds move it was or like at the beginning it was holding the 10 day and then it had moved enough where it kind of built like if you're looking at support and resistance it kind of built like a big support shelf and i'll do stuff like you know hey if the 20 day can catch up to that support shelf I'm going to switch to the 20 day moving average because I want to try to give this thing a chance to hold that support shelf. And so, for example, like right now in crowd, actually specifically um, on, you know, crowd kind of when it got going again at the start of January, it pulled back and held the 10 day on January 17th, then held the 10 day again on January 26th, it then held the 10 day again on January 31st, February 2nd, February 5th, February 6th. And, and then really, you know, this is sort of unique in that uh, on 213, it had a big gap down that held the 20 day, but it actually closed above the 10 day. So some people now might say, you know, why, you know, are you using the 10 day? That's what it's been respecting. And for me, that 310 level has become a big support shelf because that's, that's, that was the high on January 24th. And then we based under there on January 25th, February 5th, February 6th. And then we found support there on this gap down on 213. So now that the 20 days up to that level, even though it's 20 points lower, which is like, you know, in this name, it's a, you know, that's like a 6% pullback or whatever. Like I want to try to use the 20 day now because I know that's a huge level. And so I want to give this thing a chance to hold that. You know, my goal is to try to stay with my names if I think they're good names, not not necessarily to to sell them. Um, and then let's just say, let's just hypothet be hypothetical here. Let's say that crowd were to tighten here a day and then push higher and start to hold the ten day again, and we kind of get away from that support shelf. Then I might move back to the ten day. <laughs> Um, so, you know, there is a little bit of an art to it, I, I guess. And I also say there's an art to it and I'm not always right. Um, but that's, that's, I, I try to pay attention to the moving average of note. 
And then I try to pay attention to when can the 20 day get above or catch up to a big support level and then, and then give, give the name room to the 20 day. Um, just so that I can try to stick with it. Okay. I, I totally get that what you're trying to say, because it sometimes depends how the market is behaving yeah. at the moving average, right? Sometimes there are multiple confluences that make you think, Hey, now the 20 days is kind of more appropriate than the 10 days. So let's go with that. It's all about being versatile and adapting to the current yeah. market conditions. For sure. So, okay. You know, I have actually a ton of questions more to ask you, but you know, I believe you are tired. So kind of like, let's move into the closing section sure. and then guess what? We can always do a future episode, right? In yeah. The future. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, question, right? So, uh, what are some of the biggest lessons, right, that, that you've learned that are rarely spoken about? It doesn't have to be trading. It can be live, you know, just anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, man. Um, well, like, I think in trading, I think, like, one of the most important things to do in trading is, is like, you know, figure out how to not trade. You know, whether that be to you know, figure out when the market's not good for what you're doing and, and not trade. And then also, you know, figure out when the market is good for what you're doing and let your positions work. Um, you know, I think, I think especially in the era of like social media and, you know, I think everybody wants to trade like zero DTE options and, you know, make like a million percent in a month and, and retire or whatever. <laughs> you know, I think there's this uh, kind of pressure to make things happen quickly when, when in reality, like, I think, I think that's the exact opposite of kind of what actually works. You, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that stuff doesn't work, but like, I, I think like focusing on, you know, learning when the market's not good for you and not trading, and then learning how to kind of stick with your positions when they are working is, you know, something that I think gets overlooked a lot and in, in kind of some of some of what you see out there. So like learning how to not trade, you know, in different ways is, is really important. Um, and then, you know, I think just like in life, <laughs> I mean, and definitely in trading, definitely in trading. You know, you kind of, you have to learn how to bounce back and, and, and uh, you know, deal with setbacks. Like I, like every single step of the way for me um, in, in life and in trading there, there's been setbacks. So you have to learn how to bounce back and then you have to learn how to kind of learn from, from your mistakes uh, because like, like it's inevitable, like they, you, you can't avoid that. So you have to learn how to take advantage of it. And now that, you know, you have children yourself, right? I mean, they are still very young, but yeah. what would you say are some of the key lessons, values right, that you wish that they're able to take from you? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, you know, like, look, like, I, 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 I definitely just like, try to be honest and then try to do the right thing. I mean, you're not always going to do the right thing, but I think if you're, you know, doing the right thing, you know, consistently over time, you know, you're, you're going to come out ahead. Um, and then I would say kind of like one of the things that I've kind of been able to learn and understand, because like, you know, we were, we were so wealthy when I was younger and then we didn't have any money. And then I've done pretty well, but I, you know, I own some real estate and stuff in some, you know, more lower income areas. Um, and I've seen a lot of different demographics is that like money, money, like actually really, like I, I generally don't think a hundred percent makes you happy. Like I'm not going to sit there like one of these people who, who says it doesn't make it easier because I, I think it does, but you know, if you're not happy, like without money, I don't think you're going to be happy with money. Um, so I think you got to really learn to value the like things that really matter in your life. Um, like I, I think kind of, you know, two of the kind of influences on me when I grew up were, were probably these more like blue collar families where the dads, the dads kind of, uh, one of one of them is is sick right now, so I might get a little you know emotional. But you know they really like they, their family was like everything to them, and they uh, 
you know, they, they got so much joy out of all of it and they, and they were not these millionaire billionaire guys on TV, but like every day they were, they were stoked to get up, you know, they couldn't wait to kind of see what their kids were going to do. They were at every game. They were, they were doing everything. And, uh, so, you know, John, I would look, uh, you know, I think specifically in trading and actually a, a guy who's kind of a, been a mentor to me, who I, who I trade with now, who, who's much older and he, he kind of came up trading on the NYC. He, he was telling me how, you know, he knows guys who like their number 20 years ago was like, oh, if I make 5 million or whatever, like that's all I need. And they've been like chasing the number for 20 years now. And like their kids have like grown up without them, like really kind of, kind of being there. You know what I mean? Like mentally, even if they were there physically. Um, and so, you know, just like, don't, don't, don't kind of miss the things that are important, you know, just for material, material things, even though I'm trading, you know, that is kind of the, the scoreboard, you know, you can't get consumed by it. Damn. That that hits me hard too, man. Because I have kids myself, right? And yeah. often I, like you said, right? You're there, but you're not there. <laughs> you're there physically, but mentally you might not be there. So yeah, definitely a very very good reminder for me as well. So thank you for that, Oliver. Yeah. Uh, anything else you, you want to cover, man? That that you know we didn't touch on today. Anything? No, I mean uh, this this was great. I really really enjoyed this interview. So you know, thanks for having me, and uh, you know, I'd definitely be happy to come back. You know, anytime. Yep, uh, we'd love to have you back as well. I, was, I had plans of questions like, you know, when you mentioned your dad, it blew up on here, some of the lessons. I'd like to hear about, you know, change in market conditions, how you adapt, but all this, maybe we can do it another time, right? But for now, uh, where can others right, find and connect with you? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, I'm on Twitter. Uh, my name now is at Oliver Kell underscore. Um, and then I write a newsletter called The Swing Report. So www.theswingreport.com. And, you know, I do my best to just kind of highlight my, my thoughts on the market. Um, sometimes it's probably a little more chaotic than other people's newsletters because I, I keep it pretty, pretty raw. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's, that's where you can find me if you have any interest in kind of understanding how I trade and, and that's it. Awesome. I'll put all those links and resources in the in the description below, right, for the audience, right? And for now, uh, Oliver, I know it's late for you, so thank you so much once again for your time. I appreciate you. I enjoyed this session a lot. I learned so much, right, you know, from, you know, how is it like trading on the floor, the pit, what do you look for in the stocks, relative strengths, you know, building up base, buying at a first breakout, waiting for a pullback to get a secondary entry. It's an amazing session. So thank you once again, Oliver. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you, Ryan. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you and bye-bye and rest well. All right, see ya.